that may be a tough act to follow. I'm not sure if I can come up, up to it. So, anyway, hi, good morning again. I'm Joe Bumbles. Um As was mentioned by Niels, uh, Tim Strayer, and I. Tim, stand up, please, so people know who you are. We were sort of tasked with the uh, mission to bring some celebratory activities to LCN 40. Uh, I will have to say that we. We had some good ideas, we had some bad ideas, but uh, <coughs> overall I think that uh, things have worked out well. Uh, as a very special treat today, we have with us uh, a person that was, has been in the networking industry for a very long time. Uh, Bob Metcalf was an internet pioneer starting back in 1970 uh, with the work that he did at MIT, Harvard, where he received several degrees from both universities. Uh, Xerox Park and Stanford. Uh, he invented Ethernet, which uh, many people have also have made claim to, but I believe that if you check your uh, Wikipedia and other wonderful sources, you will find that Bob Metcalf was truly the inventor of Ethernet. Uh, over the year, he started uh, he started 3Com Corporation in 1979, and since then, uh, he has been he has sold something like. Uh, uh, several billion Ethernet ports, and uh, of course Bob claims that uh, wireless networking is nothing more than wireless Ethernet, so he claims those also, which I, I, I do totally agree with him on. Uh, three common public in 1984 did something like $5.7 billion uh, in 1999. In 2010, uh, three common got absorbed by, by HP. Uh, after receiving the IEEE Medal of Honor in 1996, Bob was invited to the White House uh, with his parents in 2005 to receive the National Medal of Technology for leadership in innovation, standardization, and commercialization of the Ethernet. In the 1990s, Bob was published abundant of IDG and Full World. In the 2000s, Bob was a venture capitalist at Polaris Venture Partners. In the 2010s, he is a professor of innovation and fellow of free enterprise at the Crockwell School of Engineering at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, where he is trying to uh, make Austin a better Silicon Valley. Uh, for 2015 and 2016, Bob does spend about four days of a week of his time visiting MIT as an innovation fellow. So that's sort of a brief history of someone who's done a lot in the data communications industry. So please help help me welcome Dr. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. They told me that 100 grad students were going to show up at 9.30 in the morning, which I seriously doubted, but there, there you are. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, I was on the board of the company that developed PowerPoint. We sold it to Microsoft in 1987 for $14 million. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I invented Ethernet. Well, for some values of I, and some values of invent, and some values of Ethernet. So it isn't that controversial, though. Know? Uh, but I, well, Dave Boggs and I built the first one, and Butler and Chuck. Uh, fed the ideas, and there have been, since there's 40 years, I think, at least one or 200 people who have contributed to the invention of what is today called Ethernet. What does invention mean? Does that mean patents? Does that mean papers? That that means building stuff? And then what is Ethernet? Is Ethernet CSMACD on half-inch coaxial cable? Or is it, or what is it? I think it's a business model. We'll come back to that. So today I propose to talk about Ethernet innovations. And there's two senses of that. There's the innovation of Ethernet itself, and then there's the innovation on top of Ethernet, which has occurred over the last 40-some uh, years. I understand that you're allowed to ask questions. I was wondering if anyone had a question at this point. <laughs> How about a warm-up question from somebody, a hostile question? How about a, uh, the real Ethernet inventor? Please stand up. <laughs> Wake up. Questions? Come on, help me out here. I'm begging you. So what do you think of token ring? 
question was, what do I think of token ring? I, I suppose you're referring to the IBM token ring, 802.5. Yes. Yes. Uh, I had two chances to kill it in uh, 1980, and I flubbed them. So IBM went ahead. 3Com Corporation, my company, uh, uh, shipped IBM token ring before IBM did. Uh, and it took 20 years for us to kill it. And it's dead now. And I'm uh, pleased. <laughs> So we do that one. We'll, I'm going to ref return to that subject uh, in a few moments. Well, thanks for that warm-up question. As all of you know, but I have to constantly explain to people, Ethernet is plumbing of the Internet. So here are the layers, uh, the rendition of the layers of the Internet. And then way down at the bottom is this Ethernet plumbing stuff, packet formats and so on. Uh, so we plumbers have a, an unglamorous life. But there was this one moment I want to tell you about in which um, we got the proper recognition. Steve Jobs invited me to the, um, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the opening of uh, Toy Story at Pixar, Pixar's first animated theater uh, movie. And he, um, he sent a limo, I went, saw the theater, saw the show, and he sort of had a, he, Steve, sort of had a receiving line on the way out. And there he was. And thanked him for inviting me. And then I reminded him that every single bit of Toy Story had been carried at one time or another, probably several times, over an Ethernet. And uh, Steve looked at me and smiled and said, and I'll always remember this, he said, thank you. <laughs> so occasionally we plumbers, we local computer networking plumbers, get our uh, day in the sun. So when, when I first got into this business, and when uh, this conference got into this business, uh, this is what computing looked like. This is a IBM 1401. I had one. I, my personal computer in the 60s was an IBM 1401. And then the hot new machines of the era were the PDP-10s. And I had, well, I had a PDP-6 followed by a PDP-10, my favorite machine. And, the, and then along came this man, Frank Hart, who worked at Bolt, Brannick, and Newman. Tim is here. He, he, have you seen uh, Frank recently? Uh, no, not recently. He lives in Maine, quite near where I have a house, but I haven't run into him at the grocery store yet. But he plopped down at uh, MIT Project Mac this uh, packet switch, the IMP, thereby starting my career in uh, computer networking. And I got to build this at MIT in 1970. This is called an IMP interface. It connected a PDP-10 to that in packet switch. And, and in this device, uh, and by the way, this is about a meter square. Uh, and those chips, the chips that are hidden behind this board um, are very high density. They have like two flip-flops per chip. Uh, or six inverters. A hex inverter was my favorite, the 7404, I think it was called. Built this device to carry bits at high speed, 300 kilobits per second between the time sharing uh, mini computer and the packet switch, which was the ARPANET. Uh, although, although the hardware could carry 300 kilobits per second, the software never got above about 15 kilobits per second. I don't know if you're familiar with the prefix kilo, <laughs> but uh, this was 15 kilobits per second. So I then uh, wrote a PhD thesis at Harvard, this leftmost book. It got published by MIT where I did all the work. And it's still available on Amazon.com and you can buy it. It's, uh, it's thrilling reading. Anyway, this is where most of you are now. This is me as a grad student in 1972, sitting at Xerox Research in Palo Alto. And let me point out a few interesting things. Here on the lower right is a Texas Instruments Silent 700 <coughs> terminal, and it was connected, so it carried in and out of my office then were coming 300 bits per second, 300 baud as we called them in those days, and that was superly fast. The day that Ethernet was, the first Ethernet was installed, the bandwidth of my office was increased by a factor of 10,000. So it was a big step up. Uh, up there you'll see a box of 35 millimeter slides. Have I mentioned that PowerPoint didn't come along until 1987, this is 1972. So in those days, everything was a 35 millimeter slide. This thing is called a telephone. <laughs> it had wires connected to it. This is 
a Rolodex. Perhaps you've heard that word. And uh, here are some pencils over here. Anyway, that was the, oh, it's not shown in this picture. Behind me was a table, and on it was an IBM Selectric typewriter with a re removable ball. I tended to use a, a sans serif font. So this is the internet in those days. You notice MIT is on it. I put MIT on it. I built the hardware for that. And then I went over here to Xerox and uh, put Xerox on the internet and built the hardware for that. And you'll notice the internet goes cross country with three transcontinental links, uh, including going, by the way, passing by Texas, where I live now. It didn't stop there. It just went right through Texas. And these transcontinental links carrying the entire traffic of the entire internet in the whole world, each ran at 50 kilobits per second. And then in May uh, 22nd, I wrote this memo. Uh, by the way, nothing is invented on a single day. But had I to choose a day, it was this day, May 22nd, in which Ethernet was invented. And this is the diagram in that memo, which was typed on a selectric typewriter, and then the diagram was hand drawn. This is the shared cable, the ether, we called it, that all the machines would tap into. Uh, this is uh, an early rendition of what you might call routers, carrying traffic between locations. And over here, you see that radio ethernet, ether? That's, that's where I am um, occasionally, much to the annoyance of 100 people, claim to have invented Wi-Fi 2. But there it is, radio ether. It says right there. See it right there? Right there. That was in 1973. So there were two kind of cool technical decisions made in the development of the original CSMA CD Ethernet. And one of them was the choice of Manchester encoding. So this is what happens when you put computers, a person who's mostly a computer scientist on building a network. Is you choose to do things really simply. And the Manchester encoding was really simple. We had the idea that the cable would be shared by, say, 255 attached PCs to this cable, and how would they be attached? And we came up with this idea that you would either be putting voltage on the cable or you'd be letting it go completely. Drive the cable with voltage or let it go completely. So it was on and off, on and off. And then you would create the bits on that cable by using Manchester encoding, which meant that every bit cell, and in the original Ethernet, these were 349 seconds long, you would put the bit either on or off, and then the complement of the bit on or off, and thereby each bit cell had a transition in the middle, which was uh, the clock. So this Manchester encoding solved two problems. It allowed us to not have central synchronization. Synchronization, central synchronization has been proven repeatedly to be a bad idea. And so one of the things we accomplished with Ethernet was to be sure there was no central clock. The clock was encoded in the packets. And then the cable was on and off a lot. In each bit cell, it was both on and off. And that allowed you to detect if a packet was going by reliably. Within a bit time, you could tell if a packet was going by. Uh, and also, you could tell, it turns out, uh, whether your, your transmission was being interfered with in a collision. The other, the other uh, key feature of that early Ethernet was we were sharing a cable. And the question was, how would you determine whose turn it was to transmit next? And we uh, borrowed the idea from the Aloha network. I say borrowed, actually. We never gave it back. Uh, of randomized retransmissions. But we had to con uh, convince ourselves that the randomized retransmissions uh, would eventually get through. And indeed, they did. Uh, in, during the land wars, which I'll talk about in just a second, uh, many people confused Aloha, the Aloha network, with Ethernet, accusing Ethernet of being uh, suffering from the shortcomings of Aloha. Aloha was not a LAN and ran at 4,800 bits per second. Uh, but we had carrier sense. We could tell when a packet was going by. Aloha couldn't. We had collision detection. We could tell when a packet was being interfered with. Because remember, those packets were half, off half the time and on half the time, which gave us 50% interval to detect collisions. Our packets were much bigger than the size of the network. Our network was a mile and 50 microseconds was the slot we used. 
But the packets were much longer than that, so that amortized the uh, contention overhead. And plus, we put in a back-off algorithm, so when the network got really busy, it wouldn't uh, crash in a bunch of retransmissions. So quite different from Aloha. But we did borrow randomized retransmission from Frank Quo and Norm Abramson and their team. So in 73, we built, we built a uh, transceiver to tap into the shared cable. Uh, we built a controller and some uh, code. Uh, this is where the uh, uh, standard color of Ethernet cable was established. So standard Ethernet is always a yellow cable. There are many violations of this rule, but I'm sticking by it. Any questions yet? Anyone want to blurt out a question? Is any of this interesting? Are you still with me? Here's a picture of what it looked like in 73. This is the transceiver. This is a, a vampire tap puncturing the coaxial cable to grab hold of it. Uh, transceiver electronics. These electronics were heavily biased toward being off. To turn them on, you had to work really hard. That was a reliability consideration. We didn't want anyone to uh, clobber the cable. And eventually, that uh, configuration was used to connect a building full of these personal computers, uh, Altos, they were called, in the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. But of course, you can't see the Ethernet in this picture because, of course, it's behind the wall. So the Ethernet paper came out in the same year as LCM. 1976. Uh, it took us three years to get the paper out. And notice the term local computer network. Now you know the common term today is LAN, right? But then it was local computer network, and that, it was important then. Because, for example, the word computer meant that it wasn't a terminal network. See, all the networks in those days connected dumb terminals. So what we meant by computer network is we're not networking terminals, we're networking Computers. That's why that distinction was important in 1976. And local, well, local was important because usually in those days there was one computer per city, maybe per building. So why would you need a local network to connect computers within a building? Because there weren't any. But at Xerox, we had decided to put one on every desk. Uh, so this is the paper that came out. Um, using the word local computer network, so you can see why I'm so attached to LCM. And here are several surprises. At MIT, uh, and also at Xerox, there was an M connected to the ARPANET, uh, later called the Internet. And there were four ports on the M. The MIT Multix, my PDB 610, the Math Lab 610, the AI Lab 610, and uh, our sponsor, ARPA, asked us to report each month where the traffic was going. So we would go over to the teletype on the IMP and ask it to type out packet numbers. How many packets went from MIT to UCLA to SRI to Harvard to BBN. But the biggest number on the page every single month was the number of packets that went from MIT to MIT. And we, we, this was embarrassing because the ARPANET had been built to share computers across the country, and most of this traffic was never leaving the building. So this was embarrassing. We referred to it as incestuous traffic, and we uh, didn't proudly report it to our sponsor. A few years later, this would be called land traffic, and of course, as you know, a lot of traffic is land traffic. We frequently get the question, why did Ethernet use coaxial cable and later twisted pairs and later optical fibers? Why didn't we go straight to Wi-Fi in 1973? The answer is, this is the Aloha uh, station. This is the Aloha modem. You see how big it is. This particular modem ran, I believe, at 4,800 baud, 4,800 bits per second. No kilo there, just 4,800 bits per second. The Alto personal computer was approximately that size, and we had somehow had to get this inside the Alto. And it turns out no one was able to do that until the 90s. So it took 20 years for the semiconductors to make it possible for Ethernet to go back to a Loma network to be a wireless again. So that's why we didn't go straight to Wi-Fi. And then another question was, why didn't we go straight to optical fibers and this was a paper presented here at LCN, what was that, 
seven or one of those early numbers about a network at Xerox Research we call the FiberNet. It was a 150 megabit per second optical fiber network, a transmissive star coupler. And the real reason this didn't catch on is that it, the, this device was six feet high. And it ran at 100. There was no end. Not only that, the bandwidth of the buses in the Alto couldn't carry 150 megabits per second. So this was a the expression we used, a, a fiber optic tail wagging an electronic dog. Uh, we just couldn't uh, hack it. So we had to wait until uh, dense wave division. So following that work at Xerox, in 1979, I started a company called Three Con Corporation. And there's me, and there's my favorite venture capitalist, Dick Cranluck, and there's my adult supervision, Bill Krauss, who became our CEO. And our company came into uh, being in order to join the, the coming internet, and lead in the development of standards for the coming internet. In particular, we assumed, having lived at Xerox Research, that there would be many, many personal computers. This was the dominant personal computer when our company was founded, an 8-bit machine with a 6502 processor called the Apple II. It could not support Ethernet. So what we did is, in the meantime, is we built Ethernet controllers for many computers. This is a rather f famous one uh, that Ethernet networked at Bell Labs. But eventually, after investments in Ethernet semiconductors, going from uh, this, the MSI uh, Texas Instrument 7400 series, and here's a 7400 series chip. That is a quad NAND gate chip, another favorite. Uh, eventually, we put uh, we Intel put 1103s out with memory, 1,000 bits <laughs> on a single chip, cyclic redundancy checksum, FIFOs, and then we three com invested in a chip called the C chip, the first Ethernet chip, and so paced by semiconductors, Ethernet went from an MSI base to a LSI base. We became. Uh, 3Com became a supplier of Ethernet for the Sun workstation in the 1981-82 frame. There's, you can see by that little yellow line, there's where the Ethernet is coming into the Sun workstation. And then this is the thin coaxial cable that went over to the next Sun workstation and so on. And those sold for about $1,000 each. Fortunately, in August of 1981 came the IBM PC for which Ethernet was intended, that is, a 16-bit PC or more. And we began selling Ethernets to people who had IBM PCs. Uh, this was a sales tool we used. You know, we had, we had trouble selling Ethernet to people with PCs because there were hardly, there weren't any people with PCs, so it was very hard to sell our product. Uh, but there were some people, and they uh, were reluctant to buy Ethernet. Our principal competitor was not IBM Token Ring, which I haven't uh, taken off yet. It was a network called SneakerNet. So people would say, why would I want to buy a thousand dollar car to put in my PC when I can take a diskette and put it in my PC and put my document on the diskette and then walk over to the printer with, oh, by the way, I'm wearing sneakers, and put it in and print it. So SneakerNet was our competitor. So we offered a three-node network trial. You get three cards and a diskette. And you can have three machines, share a disk, share a printer, and exchange emails on a three-node network. We sold a lot of those, and people told us that they worked, but they weren't very useful. So I came up, I was head of sales and marketing at that time, I came up with this slide, which basically said the reason that your 3Com network, your 3Com Ethernet is not very useful is that it's not big enough. You have to buy more of our products. <laughs> that worked. Uh, and it turned out I wasn't lying. Uh, that is, the larger networks, when connected to the internet, became extremely valuable. And, and we went public shortly thereafter. Here's a picture of Dave Boggs and me. He's holding an Ethernet card number zero, and I'm holding the 500,000th one here. We, that's back when we thought 500,000 was a huge number. Of course, we soon were shipping that many each month. 
So three column went public in uh, 84, and, uh, and then we entered the land wars, many of which were conducted at this meeting, I might add. That could be why I stopped going after a while. I just got <laughs> tired of it. Uh, <clears throat> had these token ring people, these token bus people, and the ARCnet people. And, um, but eventually, Ethernet won, which <laughs> accounts for many of my personality defects. <laughs> and uh, among, the, among the reasons that we won is that we have the non-standard ones, ARCnet, which came from uh, San Antonio, Texas, Data Point Corporation. The fatal mistake they made is that they were invited to submit the ARCnet specs to IEEE 802 for standardization, and they chose as a company not to submit them to IEEE. So that killed ARCnet, although you can still buy ARCnet, so it didn't kill it like all totally, but it uh, stopped being a major factor. OmniNet never worked very well. And by the way, it's always a problem when your predecessor product doesn't work, when somebody else's product doesn't work very well because then they think your product is not going to work very well. So we had a hell of a time selling against OmniNet because it didn't work very well. And then the IBM PC net, which was before they came out with before the token ring. And then there were the standards. IEEE 802 was formed in uh, December of 1979, or a month or two later, in order to standardize Ethernet. IBM and General Motors didn't like that idea, so they invaded with their own proposals, the token ring and the token bus, and after a hard political fight during which I was thrown out of the IEEE 802, so thrown out, not allowed to vote, uh, the IEEE courageously decided to standardize all three. So 802.3, 802.4, and 802.5 all became standards. Now which one won eventually? <laughs> That's not a trick question. <laughs> hey, is there any questions, by the way? Are you uh, with me still? How about a question from over there? Guess I'm not connecting over there. Yes, sir, please. Thank you. No, my question is, uh, I mean, did you believe that the uh, internet could be used in the uh, uh, buses? Yes, one of the, uh, one of the, um, chapters in the land wars was uh, had to do with a, a, a term called determinism. So Ethernet uses randomized retransmission and, uh, and I myself did mathematical models showing that the, it is possible that you could never resolve a collision where it would take a very long time. Of course, the model, the numbers involved were, you know, like the probability of all the air in this room going into that corner and having us suffocate. They're very small numbers. But this was used by people who were worried about um, uncertainty in their transmissions. And this, and so it's called determinism. So the token ring and the token bus, because of their tokens, were said to be deterministic and therefore suitable for running a nuclear power plant or a, or a numerical machining element, uh, and Ethernet was not, because it couldn't guarantee delivery uh, in a billion years or so. Uh, this was complete rubbish. That is, Ethernet, by the way, was so fast you could afford to send every packet four times and be sure that it went through, and it would still be faster than the alternatives being used. Um, so I think it's, uh, Ethernet was all, even from the very beginning, was suitable for industrial apps. No one would build a nuclear power plant to melt down because the packet didn't get through. That, is, that, that was just a, uh, a straw design. You know, let's build a nuclear power plant, and if the packet doesn't come through, let's melt down. You know, that, no one built plants like that, but that was a frequent example. A nuclear power plant might melt down if the packet didn't get through. Um, I think the real problem was that in industrial automation, there were entrenched uh, uh, leading vendors who had their own standards that were not open. And that's how they protected their share of markets is with their own standards. I think that was really it rather than determinism. Yeah, you've opened up an old wound there. Did I seem bitter? <laughs> Other question? Yes, sir. I, I don't want to restart the landlords, but 
but I notice on the non standards we don't mention ProNet. Which net? ProNet. I, I think it came from Proteon. Oh, yeah, and Howard Solomon's supposed to be here. I'm looking forward to seeing him. Are you? I'm sorry I didn't mention ProNet on this slide. I'm sorry. Was it called ProNet? But you existed way before 82.5. Oh, yeah. Yes, at MIT in 1979, we, we met there and argued about this. Right. I apologize for that omission on this slide. I didn't know it was going to be here. <laughs> yeah, by the way, this is, this is no time to bring back all the vituperation that surrounded the land wars. There was a lot of it, and a lot of people said stuff they regretted, including me, during this period. And I apologize to Howard Solomon right now, again, for anything nasty I may have said about the token rings, um, including my defense of determinism. Um, unlike the IBM token ring, the Ethernet was developed by people who understood the seven levels of the reference model. So for example, Ethernet does not have acknowledgments in it. We, it was our job to carry packets with as high reliability as possible, but we didn't have acknowledgments. If you wanted acknowledgments, they had to be in your higher level protocol. Hence, they're called TCP IP, which had all the acknowledgments in it. So we didn't put acknowledgments. We didn't put security in Ethernet. It was just packet transport. And that made uh, Ethernet uh, uh, smaller, faster, cheaper. And of course, we were uh, multi, uh, open to multi-vendor support, which IBM caught on late and, uh, and then joined out Triple lead with 802.5. But IBM's heart was never in standardization. And 3Com's own um, token, uh, token ring cards never sold well because they, they couldn't be guaranteed to work in the IBM SNA environment they didn't have SNA dust sprinkled over them. Uh, then we were lucky to get a series of operating systems that ran on top of our hardware, including our own Ether series. 3Com was the first company to ship a commercial version of TCP IP, I might add. Uh, and, um, and of course, Ethernet pivoted quite a lot. It went from thick coax to thin coax, eventually to uh, twisted pair and optical fibers, and in the 90s into radio. So let me um, quickly go through what I think are some of the lessons of the uh, history of Ethernet, the Ethervation lessons, I'm calling them. But first, I'd love to have a question from someone who's been paying attention and who i have interested, offended. Yes, sir, thank you. When was the, the, the switch to uh, Ethernet switches? So okay, I think this actually make a major uh, change in the deployment of it, the fact that actually you move to a switch model that actually is not uh, a shared, a shared uh, wire and so on. So in the 80s sometime, gradually over the 80s. And actually what was the push for that? So uh, Cheap memory. <laughs> so as memory got cheaper and cheaper, it made more and more sense to have the collisions occur in memory instead of on the wire. And so as the memories got cheaper, they got bigger, and then the collisions went away because there was then enough memory in the switch so that uh, there would be no more collisions in memory. So I, I, my answer to your question is it was the rapidly declining cost of memory led to switches because then we could, in the day of shared coax, uh, memory was uh, 1103s, which had 1,000 bits per chip, and memory was too expensive to fritter away. Anyway, that's my lame excuse for having been slow. So 3Com eventually sold switches. And uh, so now today's uh, Ethernet looks a lot like a box with a bunch of wires coming out of it, uh, or radio signals coming out of it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Also, to overcome the red frequency Ethernet, I, if I remember right, like the original Ethernet could, have only, could span only a certain length. Yeah, the first Ethernet was a, a mile, or a kilometer, I forget which but one. Uh, 
which was big enough because most Ethernets never got that big because they would there would be repeaters connecting them together. So a mile. But then you just said it's not scalable because as your speeds get higher. So so uh, later on. Uh, in the 90s, a group of us noticed that most Ethernets didn't go a mile. They only went 100 meters at most to the wiring closet. And then we noticed that the efficiency of an Ethernet, uh, we could increase its speed by a factor of 10 and still get the same performance because we built in the fact that it wasn't going as far. That left to what, led to what was called in, the, in its day fast Ethernet. 100 megabits per second. So we started a company called Grand Junction Networks to, to do fast Ethernet, and, and then Cisco bought Grand Junction. But it was noticing what you just noticed, that uh, 100 meters is a, less, is a lot less than 1,000 meters, and so whatever that collision avoidance overhead was could be scaled down. So the, I think the most enduring part of the Ethernet experience uh, is the business model. So, native internet plumbing packet, not uh, something converted from terminals, uh, using semiconductors, the latest possible semiconductors, and in fact they pace the development of Ethernet even today. The dependence on a de jure standard, uh, principally those of IEEE 802.3, dot, dot and de jure, not de facto, like um, ArcNet became de facto, was de facto. And then I made this little joke up, de IBMO. You notice IBM, de IBMO. That meant not shipping and not de jure, but standard. Uh, which is what IBM could do when, back in the days, it was the dominant monopoly. The implementations of Ethernet were owned, and Ethernet was never open source. Uh, there was fierce competition. It's always been fun to watch LAN people on panels, and particularly Ethernet panels, because they're vicious competitors, and it makes for uh, high entertainment value at conferences. But that competition could not was not allowed by the market to become interoperable, uh, non-interoperability. So there was an interoperability ethic which said, you can't really compete in this market with non-standard products. They must be interoperable. Rapid evolution with backward compatibility, and then a whole build it and they will come. I mean, I mentioned earlier that I increased the bandwidth in my office from 300 bits per second to roughly 3 megabits per second. There was no requirements document that said we needed 3 megabits per second. We just built it as fast as we reasonably could, and then the applications uh, thereby enabled, uh, came along eventually. Any questions on the Ethernet business model? Another factor was, uh, during this period, is observed the efficacy of startups. And I don't want to really go into, I have a lot of slides on this, I'm just going to go through them very quickly. Here was a startup, Cisco. If I were a better person, there would be no Cisco. They were founded way after 3Com and blew past us. Uh, Google, speaking of blowing past things, notice uh, students, here are the students, here are the professors, and here's the adult supervision, or Schmidt, a common pattern. Freecom had this pattern, Google had this pattern, Akamai had this pattern, the students, the professor, uh, and the adult supervision. Uh, and I call this the group of what was going on, I call it the Dorio Ecology, named after the the world's reputed first venture capitalist, George Dorio. And in this ecology, we have funding agencies and research professors and graduating students and scaling entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and strategic partners and early adopters, all of whom uh, come together now and then to form these startups to bring innovations to market at scale. So the funding agencies, the research professors, the graduating students, the scaling entrepreneurs, here are the scaling entrepreneurs, Eric Schmidt, and uh, here's uh, Charles Sandberg, who was uh, Zuck's adult supervision. The role of venture capitalists and angels and others. Then the role of strategic partners, large companies who have scale and brand, who will be very useful to startups. And ultimately, the early adopters. I mean, I tried to sell Ethernet in the early days in Japan 
and they kept asking me if I was from Nippon Electric Company. And then when I went to Germany, they kept asking, oh, and there's a number of Germans in this audience I hear, they kept asking me if I was from Siemens. I said, no, I'm from 3Com, it's a little company in California. I had very little success in the early days selling Ethernet, uh, except in the United States, where the, the predisposition of people was to try startup products. So thank God for early adopters. By the way, NEC and, and Siemens were later very powerful uh, supporters of Ethernet, for which I'm grateful. Another thing we saw was uh, fierce competition and the benefits thereof. Uh, but that, by the way, Fokaka is my term for that. Freedom of choice among competing alternatives. And there were 100 people providing Ethernet products from day one. Competition was fierce. Prices went down, technology evolved, customers were pleased, market grew. There was also an element of coopetition. Coopetition is when fierce competitors occasionally cooperate, say, for example, in the making of an industry standard and agreeing to be interoperable with it. Uh, and then there was the time machine. So you remember I told you about the slide that said that if your network was over a certain size, it would suddenly become valuable. And I raised the question, that was a marketing, that was a sales tool, that slide, when it first came up. Was it a lie? My answer is no, it wasn't a lie. I knew that networks of personal computers connected to laser printers and the internet, I knew it was valuable because I had a time machine. At the Xerox Research Center, I flew 10 years into the future, ended up with a company full of personal computers that are connected by a local area network and an internet an internet throughout all the Xerox. So when I put that slide out, I was not lying. I was just uh, returning from the future and uh, sharing with people how it was going to go. And uh, that's how we succeeded. So it's, by the way, it's good to have a time machine. And you'll find a lot of time machines at universities. Uh, and the question is often asked, are universities a good place to do research? And I say yes, but not because they're well-managed universities and I work at one. We have 52,000 students. We are not a well-managed institution, but we do graduate students, and they're the secret uh, to uh, getting innovation out into the world. And then there's the, the vision thing. You know, the e internet was driven by, from its very beginning, the visions of JCR Licklider and his intergalactic network. And then we had a number of laws, and I found that these laws were useful in um, driving innovation. I mean, Shockley's law on the transistor, of course the transistor made all this possible. Then there's a reason that the East Coast of the U.S. lost to Silicon Valley. The East Coast chose Grosch's law. Grosch's law said that bigger computers are better. And uh, Moore's law on, in Silicon Valley said, no, actually, smaller computers are better. So the East Coast went with Grosch, and the West Coast went with Moore, and Moore won. And that's an oversimplification of what happened between Route 128, Massachusetts, and uh, Route 101, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, and then you'll see Metcalfe's law there, which says that uh, networks are better. Connecting things together makes them more valuable. And it's these laws, particularly Moore's law, which stands out on this slide. Moore's law was an agenda setting is an agenda-setting law that tells us that it's our job to double transistor uh, density every 24 months. Um, and here's Gordon Moore saying, you have a law too? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a great, this, now the Professor Sachs has not agreed to this, but I'm calling it Sachs's law. He's plotted the cost of solar energy as a function of time. And I'm calling this Sachs law. And it, it sort of straightforwardly sells it very, like it says that very soon uh, solar energy is going to be uh, cheaper than coal, which would be welcome. And then there's platforms. So innovation proceeds and fits and starts. And, I, and what I observed in this, in the Eterbation era, was that it was the emergence of well designed open platforms that unleashed torrents of innovation. For example, the 7400 series of chips from Texas Instruments uh, allowed people to build many, many things, including allowing me to build Ethernet, uh, internet and Ethernet interfaces. Uh, the IBM 360 and the PDP-10 
were great platforms. Unix, a great platform. Windows, the IBM PC was a great platform. Facebook is a great platform, and so on. And these, when these platforms arrive, innovation takes off. And so the real question is, what will the platform, a, a real question is, what will be the platform for the Internet of Things? That's what standards. Remember HTTP and URL and HTML all came together to give us the web suddenly in 1989, <coughs> starting in 89. What consortium of standards are going to unleash the Internet of Things? I think that has yet to be determined. You guys may be working on it right here. So what's going on, uh, my view of what's going on now, is the gigification of the internet. We had a kilo internet in the 70s and a mega internet in the 80s and 90s, and we are now going to the giga gigabit internet. So ethernet is getting faster in the land. It's at 400 gigabits per second going to terabit ethernet someday. It's gone into the wide area network, and it's always been my life's goal to kill Sonnet. And the Ethernet has almost done it now uh, in the WAN. It's going over the airwaves, going back to the LOA network. You've got Wi Fi. And then you, this is a joke now. You also have LTE, which, as you know, stands for leads to Ethernet. <laughs> then, uh, then across the telecast, and for a while we had this funny condition where we had a lot of bandwidth in the LAN thanks to Ethernet, and we had a lot of bandwidth in WAN, thanks to dense wave division multiplexing, but there was a chasm between them. The carriers were not making it easy to connect the two, and that problem has been remedied with carrier Ethernet, which allows you to do gigabit, uh, allows carriers to provide gigabit service using Ethernet. And, and also, uh, networking, local computer networking is now going down into the embedded space with a bunch of, there's a bunch of standards there like Zigbee et al. 802.15.4 et al. Um, so uh, I've just run through this. Any questions about this? This is a really good time to ask questions. Yes, sir. So you mentioned about LTE. There's a, um, now efforts to bring LTE to unlicensed bands, and uh, there's a fight between LTE and unlicensed LTE and Wi-Fi. What do you think about? It seems to me that LTE and Wi-Fi need to converge eventually. And I don't know how that's going to happen. It's like they're like contending standards. And I know I'm using LTE a lot now because it's so hot. They keep asking me for Wi-Fi passwords. And, and so rather than trying to remember the password, I just use LTE instead. So uh, that's why I had to think of a clever reverse acronym for LTE because I'm rooting for Ethernet, but there's LTE. Uh, so the unlicensed band needs to go to all wireless, whether it's LTE or Wi-Fi. But they appear to be converging. I, I don't think I'm an expert in this. Do they appear to be converging? I don't know. <laughs> well, they're converging at the IP level. Yeah. IP and TCP and all that, and the web are all going on on top of it. So the, the remaining battle is way down here at our level, level one and two and three. By the way, the LP, there is a push to get some uh, asynchronous uh, transmission. So that the main issue was uh, rapid synchronized transmission, which is the cellular approach, versus asynchronous approach like uh, you know Wi-Fi and all of that. And now they actually want to push uh, more asynchronous transmission into uh, 5G, what is called. Yeah. And the motivation is to support all this IoT, where actually um, you have a lot of devices that send very little uh, information, but uh, you have so many of them, so you don't want to open a connection per, uh, per packet. Thank you. Did everyone hear that? Remember earlier I said synchrony, synchronization is a really bad thing. And there it is again, coming up. By the way, the power system, the electric power grid is synchronized. You should see all the effort that goes into synchronizing power with this 60 hertz or 50 hertz world because it's all synchronized. And so synchronization is very expensive. Uh, we struck a blow for async in 1973 by putting our clock in the packets. Yes, sir? Yeah, do you have any uh, regrets on the technical decisions you made? Uh, 
uh, one particular thing comes to my mind, like limiting the packet size to 1500 bytes, we still have a struggle moving to jumbo packet. Well, no, I, I have no regrets. I defend everything I've ever said as being true. <laughs> uh, and CSMACD was uh, transitional. It lasted for, what, 20 years, but it was transitional. And it gave way, as we heard, to uh, uh, hubs. The, the packet size, you needed a maximum packet size for two reasons. Uh, basically, it was sharing. It was, a, it was a way of guaranteeing that a certain number of stations on a shared medium could share it and it wouldn't be dominated by one. So every once in a while you had to stop transmitting to give other people a chance, and that's where the max packet size came. It also came from buffering. Memory was expensive, and so we needed to guarantee that the packets would land someplace. So if you sent a really long packet, there might not be memory for it, and so you would lose. So that, you can see the remnants of earlier constraints are still there. Of course, memory is infinite now. And so what, what is the maximum packet length? It's still, is it still 1,500 bytes? Much of the network traffic is at 1,500 bytes, although there's jumbo packets, 9,000. But most of the vendors still stick to that 1,500. Yeah, I don't think the short pack, the relatively short packets has hurt much over the years. But that was its purpose, was to memory was expensive and we wanted there to be sharing. One of the early considerations in Ethernet was that the sharing be fair, that everybody get a fair crack at it. So we had to prove with statistical models that eventually you'd get your share even though it was somewhat random. Other questions? Yes, Tim. So you just said that you don't regret anything that you did in Ethernet, but if you could go back and change one significant Thing, knowing what you know now, uh, and see the landscape the way you see it now, what, what would that be? Didn't we just go through that now with Back to the Future? <laughs> <laughs> now, things have worked out so well for Ethernet 3 and me that I would, I would not want to mess with the past at all. But who knows what would happen if you change it one little thing back then. The, uh, um, all right, here's a regret. It's a different kind of answer than you're looking for. In 1980, I was given two chances to convince the IBM Corporation not to do token ring, but to do Ethernet. They paid me $2,000 to go to Research Triangle Park, and they paid me $2,000 to go to Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, the Office Products Division, and pitch Ethernet. I went, and I slaughtered them, because none of them had ever built a LAN, and I had built one six years before. So I was really expert, and I won those two arguments. And that's when I learned that you can win the argument and lose the order. So I wish I had learned a little bit more about selling before I had gone to those two engagements, because I would have saved us all 20 years of uh, token ring, IBM token ring. So you can win the argument, but you want to win the order instead. So that's what I learned from there. So I'd have done that differently. I would have quickly studied up on how to sell, and how winning the argument is not often the way to sell. You have to do more listening than I was inclined to do. Let's see what other. Do you, do you know why the first Ethernet ran at 2.94 megabits per second? Was it because we had a requirements document that said 2.94 was exactly the correct answer? Was it because 2.94 is a multiple of pi or e or something? No. Dave and I were, Dave Boggs and I were building that first Ethernet card. And we put the FIFOs in there, and the CRC was on the corner of it. And there was no more space on the card, and we didn't have a clock. And you need to put an oscillator and some transistor, you know, resistors and stuff on. And there was no room for the clock. And then we noticed that the back plane had a clock, the system clock for this little PC, which ticked every 170 nanoseconds. So we took the Instead of having a clock circuit, we took the clock from the back plane and used it to toggle the Manchester encoder two toggles per bit, that's 340 nanoseconds, which if you do the reciprocal, turns out to be 2.94 megabits per second. Way more than anyone could understand how to use, but um, that's where it came from. So for years I've been resisting saying 3 megabits per second. I like to say 2.94, and why is that? 
In, that, in those days, the tra as I mentioned previously, the transcontinental links of the entire internet ran at 50 kilobits per second, which is rounding error when you go from 2.94 to 3. So that's why I insist on using 2.94 to remind us how pitifully slow the internet was in those days. By the way, we thought it was fast, but it was, in retrospect, pitifully slow. Other questions? Yes, sir. Now, when I was a graduate student, the essence of Ethernet was is an ACP. There was this protocol discussions, token rings passing the token around the ring, token bus passing the token around the bus. And really, for me at that time, the essence was using C as an ACP in Ethernet. Today, we have, since some time, we have Ethernet without carrier sending, without collision detection, and through a major channels or without uh, life access. So what really is the essence of Ethernet? Is it frame format and a business model? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the CSMA CD was, I like to think of it as transition, as I mentioned earlier. When we went out to sell the Ethernet in its early days, we didn't have to sell a box. We just put these cards in the PCs and hooked them together. There was no big box in some room somewhere. And it, it, it did work. So then later, as the memory cost came down, we switched to this uh, the familiar mode of a bo big box in the closet with, now we're switching to yet another mode. We're going all the way back to the low one now. Uh, these are all transitional examples of transitional technology. So it's, you know, it's unfair to, to evaluate that technology with today's constraints, because it was designed under a set of constraints then, like the cost of the 1103 chip, was a major constraint, which has since been relaxed. So you'd do it differently. You would, you'd do it differently now. You wouldn't do it differently then. It's past 10.30. Shall we end, or is there one more exciting question? Yes. some years there have been engineers at work and they've been um, optimizing like NATS network address translation is another one of these violations of the laws of physics which has worked wonderfully well uh, you know, kept IP version 4 version 4 is still heavily used isn't it thanks to NATS pretty much and the uh, the complexities of spanning trees and so on are all after my time basically so I, I can't regret them. What's her name? Radio. She should regret. If it needs regretting, Radio Perlman should be regretting. <laughs> no, so I think that the layering, the ISO reference model, the seven levels, one, two, three, four, six, seven, is one of the key winning design features of the internet. Because of all the, the uh, parallelism and serendipity that unleashed, that as progress could be made at each layer independently of the others. Uh, at each point of the seven levels, there was an opportunity to do a well-defined general purpose API for accessing the facilities below. And that serendipity worked. Proof, TCP IP was invented in 1973. The World Wide Web was invented in 1989. And it worked. And that was due to the I think the uh, resilience of this layered model and all of the general purposeness that it carried with it going forward. Thank you very much for your attention.
uh, now have a short break and we'll, we'll continue at uh, yeah, 11 with the uh, best paper plenary and we'll continue with the uh, yeah, 40th anniversary celebrations and discussions about the past within the panel this afternoon. So um, yeah, enjoy the coffee and come back in about 20 minutes. Thank you.